Okay, members, good afternoon. It's four o'clock, according to the Guild Hall clock. Uh, you're all very welcome to today's meeting. I'm going to hand to John, uh, the Chief Executive, just to take the roll call. John. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members, to all members of Governance and Strategic Planning Committee. You're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, which will be a hybrid meeting to be conducted remotely via WebEx and physically here in the Council Chamber in the Guild Hall, Tuesday, the 5th of April at 4 o'clock. Starting with the roll call, Alderman Devaney. Here, John. Alderman McClintock. Here, John. Alderman McCready. Here. Councillor John Boyle. Here. Councillor Gary Donnelly. Councillor Shaw. Councillor Doyle. Councillor Duffy. And Shaw. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Fleming. Shaw, John. Councillor Heaney. And Shaw. Councillor McHugh. Councillor Mooney. Here. And Councillor Riley. Here. Thanks, Thank John. You, John, my name wasn't called. Thank you, Alderman Breslin. Did you get mine, John? Did you as well? I did, Alderman Devaney. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, the next item is the statement for remote meetings, uh, which I'll read now. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who is in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A, co a copy of the Council Privacy Notice is available on the Council website. Members, moving on to item four, which is declarations of members' interests. If anyone has any declarations of interest, please make them known now, or as the meeting or, uh, continues on, you can um, put them into the chat box or call them out here in the chamber. And I see that uh, Councillor McHugh is just put in the chat box that he's present, so if he can be marked as present, please. Um, okay, members, that moves us to item five, which is the deputation. Uh, so we're going to hand over to uh, Firmus Energy. We're going to receive a deputation from Niall Martindale, the Interim Mar Managing Director, and Paul Stanfield, the Director of Marketing and Customer Sales. Uh, it's obviously a very timely deputation given uh, the cost of living emergency that's facing uh, citizens right across our council area and, and right across uh, the island uh, in relation to uh, rising prices, uh, not just of gas, but of a range of other household bills. Uh, so happy to open up to the deputation. And then after you have made your presentation, I'll open it up to the floor for comments and questions. Uh, so over to yourselves. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon um, to all members here today, both <clears throat> online and, um, and in the chamber itself. It's, uh, as you say, uh, a very timely opportunity for us to be with uh, the council here today, and we were very uh, um, grateful for the opportunity to to talk to you today. As part of this presentation, we had provided a number of slides, and um, they're being shared at the moment. Chair, with your permission, um, I would like to draw brief attention to one or two key points within the slides, but I don't intend to uh, go through the slides in detail. But I'd rather take this opportunity to open to the floor and really take the time and as much time as uh, we have permitted here today to, uh, to, to to council members to really put questions to myself uh, and Paul for that matter on, on, uh, from, from the floor. What I would like just to say is Derry is an extremely important part of the success of Firmus Energy in Northern Ireland. We've been in Derry since 2005. Um, as a firm, we've invested over 40 million pounds already in the Derry um, city, city area, city centre area, and environs. We have 17,000 customers there, and we have gas outside a further 25,000 properties. It is an incredibly important time 
Um, from Firm Energy's point of view, the last 12 months has been an incredibly challenging time and we fully accept uh, and, and indeed empathise with everyone across Northern Ireland, but particularly in the Northwest area. We are subject to all matters uh, and means of the cost of living crisis, and we accept that energy is one of those key matters within the cost of living crisis. And in that context, we're very much in, in the eye of this storm, and we accept that. What we want to do as a business is remain strong through this period. We want to remain strong for customers in the dairy area, and again, right throughout Northern Ireland, to get through this uh, crisis, quite frankly. So as we come out the other side in a stronger and better place, and for that matter, our erst why and hope is to be announcing price decreases for those in, again, Derry and our greater Ten Towns area and Belfast and also um, as soon as we possibly can do so. We are at this moment in time shackled by the commodity prices on the wholesale gas market. And regrettably, we've had to pass those through on a number of occasions. Those numbers of occasions have been reflected by our resistance to do it in, uh, if you like, one file or anticipated swoop. But nonetheless, we appreciate that that has um, resonated strongly with residents and customers of ours in Derry um, at this very, very difficult uh, time. So those are just some opening remarks. I'm happy to step through the slides, but I, I, I just wonder if my time and our time today at Council is better opened to the floor. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that, uh, Niall. I'm, I'm conscious that uh, your presentation had been circulated to members in advance, so members may well have <coughs> had the opportunity to look through that in detail. I do have indicated speakers uh, wishing to come in at this stage, so um, unless you want to, uh, 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 Paul wants to add anything at this stage, happy to, to open it up to the, the floor. I'm, I'm okay at the minute, ready for any questions that come up, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Paul. Okay, uh, we'll go then to inter interested councillors uh, who have indicated to speak. So here in the Chamber, Councillor Rory Farrell. Go ahead, Rory. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Niall. And Paul for coming here uh, today. And you know, I'm going to be brutally honest from the outset. You know, this is going to be an incredibly awkward and incredibly uncomfortable conversation today. But nowhere near as awkward or uncomfortable um, as the relentless raft of price increases that your customers have faced over, over the past year. And last week, when I heard about your latest price increase of 16% in the radio. I initially uh, mistook it as 60%. And to be fair, that wouldn't have surprised me at all. Um, the magnitude of, of these price raises, you know, they're relentless, they're constant, and people are just wondering, when are these going to stop? Um, people are fed up with these price raises. Um, people are, are genuinely struggling with these price raises and ultimately people cannot afford these price raises and they shouldn't have to. Um, Firmus issues the bills and Firmus and its various parent companies have very deep pockets. And there's this myth that Firmus is a small time operation based in Antrim. Um, and what, what's largely ignored is that Firmus is owned by Equitix, which is an asset management company with assets in the region of £8 billion. And what's completely ignored is that Equitix is 70% owned, 75% owned by Tetragon Financial Group Asset Management, which boasts on its website of assets in the region of $37 billion. And just let that sink in, $37 billion. It, it's an eye-watering sum. So those are very deep pockets, um, a lot deeper than the combined wealth of all the customers that, that you serve 
in one of the most deprived areas of Western Europe. Um, these price rises are sickening. They are scandalous. And if we look over the past year, 17% in March last year, 35% in September, 38% in November, 33% in February, and then a further 16% there in March. You know, people are scunnered. People are completely and utterly scunnered with it all, and, and urgent action is required. Um, there are things that can be done to help citizens across this city and district and across the north uh, in the face of this crisis. We believe that the economy department and the utility regular needs to reduce the profit cap on energy companies. Currently, it's set at 2%. It needs to be lower. Um, we believe that the economy department and the utility regulator needs to introduce a price cap on gas, similar to the system that's in operation in Britain. And finally, we believe that Firmus and its bosses in Equitex and its overlords in Tetragon need to agree to implement no further price increases for the remainder of that, this financial year. Um, this is our view. People need help. They need support, and they need it now because the current situation is an absolute joke. So I would be keen to understand your views on that. Thank you very much. And Chair, I'm going to make that as a formal proposal, so I'm going to put something in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Councillor Farrell. Um, okay. Thank you, Councillor Mooney, for seconding it. If you want to pop it into the chat box. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'll take the next indicated speaker. Uh, it's Alderman McClintock. Go ahead, Hilary. Thanks, Chair. And thank you to Niall and Paul. This, I hope, is an uncomfortable meeting for you today. I certainly think that uh, it should be. I think, like um, the previous speaker, absolutely disgusted to think of the profits that are being made by the energy companies at this time. You talked at the beginning, Niall, about a successful operation, and you talked about the number of places that gas pipelines are being installed. Obviously, I've seen the evidence of that locally at this time. Why anybody wants to put gas into their home at this time, I just cannot understand. I think it is absolutely despicable to think that a company like Firmus and its governing body or parent body is making such a fortune and seeing the misery that people in our area are actually suffering at the moment. I don't understand, and I suppose I would like clarification as to whether as to why the Ten Towns network is paying so much more than other areas of our province at this time. One of the things that I find, and we're obviously all out canvassing for the election at this moment, one of the things that I find really sad yesterday going around the doors was the number of people, and particularly elderly people, that I saw in the middle of the day wearing their dressing gowns and apologising because it was the only way they could keep warm. People are disgusted at the profits that they are being made by the um, by the company, and they are doing nothing, absolutely nothing, to help people. Um, I think it's it's disgusting, and I think it's time that the uh, that the energy companies actually did something to to um, help the situation because we are in a series of crises. Um, I am just on, com going to comment actually on Councillor Farrell's um, notice, uh, if I may, and I think that I, I just see the bit about the moratorium and gas price increases, and I would agree with them, and I will be supporting that uh, that notice of motion before it comes before it. But I think that the energy companies really must be ashamed of themselves when they see the misery that people are living in at the present time. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Alderman McClintock. Uh, just for the benefit of Firmus, uh, we have a number of indicated speakers, so I'll go through the three additional speakers that have indicated they wish to speak, and then I'll bring us back in uh, after they have spoken. So next on the list is Councillor Sean Harkin. Go ahead, Sean. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I, I think that the Firmus officials will be well aware that we're uh, knee deep now in what is a hardship emergency, and it's it's not a hardship emergency for everybody. It's a hardship emergency for workers uh, and for the least well off uh, right across our society. 
and uh, there needs to be uh, radical and straight into action. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, you're, you're listening to some of the executive parties now who maybe have been cheerleaders for energy privatization uh, for the last decade or two. Uh, and it might sound a bit hypocritical coming from them that at this late date, uh, they're piling on the criticisms. Um, but all these, uh, this is because the pressure is so uh, deep right now, uh, right across our communities, and because people are struggling so much that uh, all these executive parties are being forced to respond and use this kind of language that you've probably never heard from them before. Um, so I understand if you're a bit, uh, you know, you find that ironic yourself. Uh, we have a number of uh, things we want you to consider as people before profit, um, because we think it's, first of all, we think it's immoral that you're making any profits at this point, given the scale of struggling uh, and suffering that exists in our communities. Um, so we would say, we would like to hear if Firmus is willing to commit to not making any more profits at all uh, during this um, crisis. And if you commit to that, it means that you can actually reduce your, 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 uh, your, your prices immediately. Um, if you make the decision not to, not to have any profits at all, even 2%. Uh, the second thing is, we believe that, uh, that you should transfer all the profits that you've made over the last year in our district, from residents in our district, through these massive price hikes. Uh, and that should go into the council-led hardship fund that we have set up. Uh, we don't think that there's any justification right now for payouts to shareholders. And it is the case that, um, you know, Firmus is, is an operation based here in, in, the, in Ireland, uh, but that you do have parent companies that operate out of tax havens that are worth an absolute fortune and who've been making a tremendous amount of money over the last number of years and, and have had massive payouts to shareholders uh, and that can't go on. Um, so will you uh, hand back the profits that you've made over the last year uh, in this district and put it into our council-led hardship fund. Um, there's a, a third question, which is about, can you clarify whether or not people here in Derry are paying over the odds in terms of the cost of uh, gas? Are we paying more in Derry than in, than in other parts of the North? And can you give an explanation for that? And if it's true, uh, will you pay that money back to residents that have been paying uh, over the odds? Um, if Stormont uh, does come back uh, after May, uh, and if it does agree to the proposal to set up hardship emergency, will Firmus agree to put a substantial amount of money into that to actually help people get through uh, this uh, crisis? And then the last question we have for you is, um, and this is these are only some proposals that that are possible to make given the scale of this crisis. Uh, and, and Firmus are not the only uh, energy company that are profiteering. This applies to all of them. Um, but will you be, uh, are, are, can you give an ironclad commitment that no, no resident will, be, uh, will have their gas turned off as a result of non-payment? So that's five questions for you. Uh, and we would, we would appreciate an answer. And these are questions we are bringing, but we are bringing these uh, on behalf of uh, campaigners and residents uh, right across our district. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harkin. Um, a few more indicated speakers. Um, next on the list was uh, Councillor Duffy. Sandra. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and thank you, Niall and Paul, for coming along here today. I have to say, um, I think it's right that we're not going through the presentation. And I, I want to comment that in previous years, when you have come to present the committee, I have always been keen to engage on behalf of um, our constituents who have been seeking to get gas installed in, in their streets, in their areas, and have been campaigning for that. And normally it's, a, it's, it's an engagement that I look forward to on that basis. But today, I, it is an uncomfortable meeting with yourselves because of where we're, where we're at. Um, I think it's absolutely right that we concentrate right now on the, the cost of living crisis that is placing huge burden on our, our constituents who have got gas in, in, in good faith and are now seeing themselves faced with hike after hike after hike. I, I, I think Councillor Farrell's 
um, figure that he put there, the, the $37 billion, that, that's frightening. Um, that's absolutely, it's, it is immoral um, to think about it, but I have to say that we, we, whilst we do accept that it is a global crisis, it would be absolutely remiss of us not to comment as well on the huge profits that are, are regularly reported by energy companies such as yourself, or indeed the huge salaries that um, senior directors within your company or other companies report um, on an annual basis. Uh, those are squares that our, our, our constituents just can't circle because it's unfathomable to them how they are struggling. They're sitting at home, they're sitting um, in coats and they're sitting under blankets in the middle of the day because they can't afford to put the heat on. And you know they they look at the huge profits that are being made by energy companies, and they can't understand when the huge profits are being made that there is huge price hikes that are coming down their way. People genuinely can't cope um, with the increases that have already been announced, and they're absolutely fearful of what is coming next. Um, so as, as a party, I know that we have met with yourselves, um, Kira Ferguson and Patrick Delar. You met recently. Um, with yourselves and discuss some of some of these issues. Um, we did discuss around um, the monopoly that is perceived that um, firms do have um, in the ten town area. So that that is something that we address. And I know that you you, you did discuss that with yourselves. Um, I, I think the people out there just can't understand what is happening. They they are afraid of a knock on the door. They're afraid of the next bill landing on their doorstep because they just don't know where to turn. There is a, a real feeling of desperation out there. Um, as a party, I know that we have been, we recognise that it is wider than just firmness and we have been calling for one fall taxes and for a reduction in VAT for people. But I suppose um, Councillor Harkin did ask one of the questions here that, that I have sincerely been asking for a while in terms of the Northwest and in terms of the Chant Network. There is a perception that we pay much more than other areas. And I know there was another announcement today in relation to Belfast, but why the difference between the 10 towns in Belfast? Because it's the same gas, it's the same pipeline from my understanding. So why would we in this area need to be paying more than, than other areas? So that's a question that I would definitely like um, addressed by yourselves. Um, and just in terms of Councillor Farrell's proposal there, um, we would be absolutely happy to support that going forward. I think we need to be doing everything that we can um, to address the spiral and costs that are putting real pressure on people. And, you know, while it is pressure on them, it's the mental health pressure as well that these families, these young families, these older people are under on a daily basis. And I think that we need to be doing everything that we can. And as an energy provider, um, you, you need to be doing everything that you can as well. And I think that I would like a commitment. I don't know, I, I know you can't make it today, that there's no more hikes coming down the line for people because they, they genuinely cannot cope with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Alderman McCready, go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I recall a similar presentation, I was probably about a year ago, Chair, uh, with Firmus coming in with um, all these facts and figures of investment, uh, rolling out and extending their services. And between that point in time and now, and everything in between, I've seen them digging up the roads, connecting all these people. It's fantastic, mm -hmm. everyone was getting, changing over to gas. And the reality certainly hit in pretty sharply that firmness now have a stranglehold on the majority of our citizens here. And I'm quite disgusted of what's happening. And I've got a series of questions that I would like uh, an answer, either on the record here or written as a follow up. Chair, the first question is what was the net profit paid to shareholders in firmness in the past two financial years? and indeed the associated parent companies linked with Firmus. And, and I'd like that figure provided in both a percentage and indeed an actual quantum. Second question, Chair, why will Firmus not absorb 
these increases within the gross profit margin within the parent companies, they are better placed to absorb this in order to keep our customers or their customers in the future. Because what is happening right now is their cost customers can't even afford to pay them, but yet they don't have an option to go anywhere else. And the, the third question is why are there disparities between prices and postcodes? I, Chair, there's, uh, there's very few words I can actually say on record. I'm not fuming uh, with the situation we find ourselves in. And other members of this committee have eloquently said it and sharply said it. And so I'd like just straight answers to my straight questions because the people of this city and district deserve these answers. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Ryan. Um... I have two more indicated speakers, which I'm going to take, and then I'll go back to uh, Niall and Paul. So, Councillor Doyle and then Councillor Donnelly. Go ahead, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a strange meeting, I have to say, because I requested Firmus um, to come in a couple of months ago, uh, and it was actually to do with something completely different. Um, so, I'm glad that I requested it then and that they're here now. Um, look, it's the situation that is that I am finding myself in in going to people's houses in this district now is getting to a point where it is scary. Um, people are doing things that they should not be doing and not have to do to keep warm um, and they're firmest customers. Um, I do have a, a series of questions, uh, but I want to put a number of scenarios as well uh, with those. Uh, I know that Sean, had, I think, had mentioned around um, the April 22 regulator report that, that would outline that the 10 towns district is paying more uh, than anywhere else on these items for gas. So uh, obviously we're going to get um, uh, word on that. But more specifically, um, gentlemen, on the 18th of August last year, Firmus received a letter from the regulator uh, on winter 2021 engagement with customers. And it, uh, you as well as other suppliers were asked to establish and their individual or collective hardship funds to help struggling customers. Um, and it was also very strictly referred to that customers should not uh, be disconnected under any circumstances. And that those people self disconnecting uh, as a result of their, their inability to pay would uh, be contacted by, um, have you done any of that? With particular reference to the hardship fund, have you done uh, and how have you done that? Uh, your your parent company, uh, and we had a look at the, the figures last night, um, reported revenues of £97.5 million in the most recent uh, records from Companies House. Um, I, I, you know, and the question has to be, given what I've seen, given what people are, are going through, how much profit is enough? And I mean, I, I don't expect that you'll have an answer to that today. Um, because I have to say that um, I, I kind of feel almost sorry for you to have to come here today when the chief executive should have been here to answer these questions. But I want to put this scenario to you, gentlemen. I got a call from a constituent who's a customer of yours during the week. She works 20 hours a week. She's got two young fellows in the house. She comes home and makes a dinner for the Waynes as soon as they get home from school. So they'll have some warm in the house. And then when they're all finished and they want to sit down and watch the TV, she gets three hot water bottles and wraps each of them in a towel and they put them up their tops. Now, from the recent accounts that I've seen, one of your directors, your highest paid director was paid £309,000 in that year. And my question to you is, how can you justify that against what my constituents, who are your customers and you have a duty of care to, how can you justify the difference between how they live and the money that is being paid out as a result of the money that you are taking from our custom, from customers who are our constituents? Is that you concluded, Councillor Doyle? It is, Chair. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, and then the final speaker before we go back uh, to the deputation is Councillor Donnelly. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, you know, what, what, what you are doing here is doing untold damage to our community. And, and I know this because of talking to people on a, on a daily basis. And here's how they would describe what's being done. They would describe it, it has been described as, as extortion, as criminal, and as immoral. And basically it's been done, what they're saying to me, it's been done by gangsters in suits. It's absolutely wrong. Previous speakers have outlined the huge profits, the, 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 the money that's being paid, the people within this organization. And effectively, it's, it's already been said here before me. I don't want to hear excuses. What I want to hear the day is I want to hear from you what you're going to do about it to stop the untold damage that you're doing to our community. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, that's all the indicator speakers I have at this stage. Uh, and I think from all of the speakers, uh, you'll have heard, uh, I think, the degree of frustration and sense of urgency that is required uh, to tackle the issues that are here. Um, I'm going to hand back to yourself, Niall, and to Paul, uh, and you have a chance then to go through uh, the various different questions that were asked. I'm conscious that Councillor Farrell has a proposal that's been seconded, and we'll come to that, but I'll allow Firmus to respond to the questions that have been asked at this stage. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Rory, Hilary, Sean. Senator Ryan, Emmett, and, uh, and Gary, you'll appreciate there's quite a lot in there, but understandably, there's a smaller number of common themes, which many of which we would accept, some that I'm going to address in, in just a moment. Um, the first one is, um, you know, th th this word monopoly quite often comes up and, and, and um, uh, has been described just there as a, as a stranglehold in dairy. That is not and I would just like to, <laughs> to say this strongly, that is most certainly not the approach that we have to any of our customers, and certainly uh, not least those in dairy. Um, our customers are important to us, and I fully appreciate Emma, Emmett in particular, the, the story that, that you've just described there is, is, is frankly devastating, but we are um, familiar, quite frankly, with that story in the common context again of the energy crisis and the role that energy is playing within that but just to go back to firms specifically for a moment the market in the 10 towns area has been open to competition since 2015. any time that we want to reflect market conditions in the tariffs and, and please just let me say it the gas commodity on the wholesale market is currently reflected yes in the 10 towns tariffs but that is subject to scrutiny from the utility regulator, from the Department for the Economy, and for the, from the Consumer Council of Northern Ireland. It is not done unilaterally here within Firmus Energy. We do that, we, it goes to consultation, and then we have to announce the, the increase. And whilst I accept many of the points that, that have been, been shared there, we, we do that, and it has been an incredibly challenging time with us in Firmus Energy having to do that, because frankly, we don't want to, but our hands have been forced by global markets. Now back to the profits piece. Every individual business must stand on its own two feet, and that goes no least for Firmus Supply. We will be posting our accounts to Companies House in a number of months' time, and I invite any of the councillors, aldermen, uh, with us today to have a look at those accounts. What they will reflect is the fact that we have been paying as a business much more than the tariffs have been collecting for customers right across Northern Ireland for firm supply. And I, I say I will invite, or if anyone wants me to post them, I will do that once they're, they're subject to auditing. But that will show the degree or not, as the case may be, of profits within the supply business in the last 12 months. Um, I'm just going to flick through my notes here and some of the questions. So Bear with me one second. There was a uh, question around paying over the odds in dairy. Well, that's not the case. We do have two different markets. Those markets at times are managed um, within the dynamics that they operate, quite frankly. But let me reassure councillors and all of them here today that 
everybody, every customer, whether you're in Derry, Newry, Belfast, Ballymena, Antrim, wherever you might be, they will end up paying the same cost as what it costs us to purchase that gas in the wholesale market. Any differences, and over the years there have been differences. Back in uh, 2020, we were able to take the price down by over 30% in uh, 10 towns. That was 20% uh, down in Belfast. And we started from slightly different bases. So over the years, there have been slight differences in those markets, but they all washed through and the regulator would acknowledge that also. There was reference to a report on the 18th of August. Emmett, um, you, you'd mentioned that report on engagement. We responded to the regulator in terms of the measures that, that, that we are taking to engage with customers. And, and I know you had a number of uh, questions in that. The first thing I would note is we did, as a business, make a contribution um, to the scheme run. It was administered actually by, by, by Bryson Energy on behalf of Data Hargan and, and DFC. We made a contribution to that. And we are up until the end of March, we continued to de dedicate a number of um, administrative resources to making that scheme happen. Um, and there was another one in terms of isolation. What we've said, and we will say it today again, we always said in our communication to customers, we want them to make contact with us if they're finding it difficult to pay their bills. And we will work with them on every single occasion to find a way to make that happen. You know, you know, it, it's we've obviously come along today and we're, we're you know, we appreciate uh, some of the commentary that, it, the, that has come our direction. If I'm being frank, it, it wasn't uh, unanticipated, should we say. Um, we, we do accept and we do have sympathy and indeed empathy with customers and dairy. And as I said from the very outset, we want to work to get through this together. I'm not sure, I'm sure there's a number of questions in there I haven't perhaps addressed directly, but I'm happy to do so on writing. If chair, uh, that can be shared with us perhaps after this event. Yep, no, thank you for that, Niall. Uh, it, it will be possible for you to go back and view uh, the comments and the questions that have been submitted and, and to respond sure. if you do miss anything. I, sure. I see, sorry, who's that looking to come in? I was me, sir, Emmett. Okay, Emmett. Um, yeah, I'm a gesture. Sorry, I thought there was somebody else trying to come in uh, as well. Um, yeah, I, so th there will be a chance for yourselves to to play back and and to, and to catch up any of the questions that that uh, that you aren't in a position to answer right now. Uh, a couple of speakers have come into the chat box now, indicating they wish to speak again. So I'll go through them in order. Councillor Doy, go ahead. In terms of the, I, I I had the letter here, but I don't have it with me at the moment on the 18th of August. Uh, my understanding was that the letter said, with regards to people who uh, have self disconnected because they can't pay, that actually you would be monitoring that as a company and that you would contact them. So if you could clarify that and uh, not, not to be rude about it because I don't want to, to, to get to that point, but in terms of the the contribution that you've made, that you say you've made to the fund by DFC, can you tell us how much that was? Can you tell us, because I, I, in, in truth, I've asked DFC for it, and they say they don't have the information, which I find suspect, but, um, you know, I, I, and the reason why I'm asking that is very clear. I want to measure that against your, your profit, quite frankly. I want to know what it is you, you as a company believe is appropriate to put together as a, as a hardship fund um, for your customers. Um, but in terms of, you know, look, my constituents don't need sympathy. They don't want sympathy. They want help. And they're not going to get it from the executive. But they have to get it from you. And, the, you know, the regulator isn't doing anywhere near enough, in my view, to protect consumers. But the fact of the matter is, it's not exactly as if firmus are, are in the red. You know, there are multi-million pounds being made. And, 
you know, I've heard figures bandied about around 2 million and 3 million here and there for, for hardship fund, you know, in terms of, if that's the case, and, and I'm hoping you'll tell me, if that's the case against, you know, a group profits of nearly a hundred million pound in the last term that your published accounts were out, <laughs> I mean, that's just not on, it's just not totally unacceptable. So are you able to tell me that? Well, there's a couple of things, Emmett or Chair, sorry, maybe I'm jumping the gun slightly with, would you like to ask another question? Yeah, no, that's that okay. Go ahead, Neil. Sorry, Chair. Um, Emmett, a couple of things there. One, I don't recognise £100 million profit. Uh, and I've already stated it. And, and subject, I wish I could share it with you the, today, but that our accounts in the supply business are subject to auditing, which is why I'm not going to give you an exact number, to be frank, but, but I will tell you uh, it's, it's not positive, right? And that simply is down to the fact that we have been absor absorbing all the uh, sustained and unprecedented, frankly, gas prices and wholesale gas prices over the last, particularly in the last six months, but they've been on the increase for the last 12 months. And so, so the, as I said, the tariffs that we've regrettably had to implement over the last number of months are reflective of the wholesale market. And I, I, I just said for the record again, I don't recognise the £100 million pound number. But I'm happy to, once those counts have been audited, I'm happy to share them with you. In fact, they'll be available in Companies House. Um, in terms of the contribution, um, I'm not going to share the contribution. All I'll say is there were 11 companies subject and asked by um, the uh, the DFC. Actually, it was the Consumer Council, to be frank, who were who were coordinating that piece, um, and 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 they. Uh, are aware of what we've made as the Consumer Council for Northern Ireland in terms of that contribution to make that scheme, um, enable that scheme, quite frankly, that ran to the end of March. Um, and whilst they appreciate, Emma, you, you made the point, you don't want, you know, perhaps we need to do more than sympathy, but I, I do get that. And it's easy for me to sit here and say that everybody in Firmus Energy gets that and, and you think, well, almost so what? But, 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 you know, I would like to put it on record again. We care for customers. We are a local company. We're based in Antrim. We've always prided ourselves on doing the best for our local communities and those communities into which we operate. And that will not change. And whilst I accept fully that we're going through an unprecedented energy crisis and cost of living crisis more to, to, to the point, um, we want to be there for customers when we get out the other side of this and we will work to remain strong as a business and to give back to those people of Derry and right across Northern Ireland that we serve. So I want to give that assurance. Uh, sorry, Chair, that's just... Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Maeve O'Neill and then Councillor Harkin and then Councillor Duffy. Maeve. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, like other councillors, don't really feel reassured, I have to say, Fermis, uh, by your care and commitment for our local residents here. Um, I, I don't feel uh, that the, the question has really been answered around profits, and I think uh, the problem is the our energy model here, um, where there has to be a profit because it's a privatised business. You know, so, uh, like, are you open to the possibility of nationalisation of, of your energy company? Um, because, you know, really that is that is then properly caring because like right now there needs to be radical action and radical change. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that like gas is uh, really uh, future proofing our, our, our energy supply. You're talking about green hydrogen within the presentation. Uh, however, there has been concerns that this is a, a greenwashing of uh of energy solutions and you know uh i just uh what like oh, there's a there's a few gas installers which i've been chatting to who um are basically now having to go and learn uh the installation of heat pumps because um you know there's no market now in terms of gas installation because of the cost of fairness um uh gas and uh and, and really you know uh they're they're upscaling now in that electric um energy um and i just uh wondered uh, for comment on the University of Exeter report from last year. I'm not sure if user, I'm sure you are uh, aware of it, 
uh, but it, that report called into question uh, the governance in the Department of the, uh, the Economy and the heavy influence uh, from uh, industry uh, like yourselves that that department facilitates for. And it's very, very difficult whenever we have um, energy strategies coming from the Department of Economy and those close ties uh, that Fermis Energy then has that the, this report uh, evidenced last March. So I just want uh, some comment on that because, you know, I, I'm not sure how we are to, uh, you know, as a society transition to renewable energies when we've got our hand, hands tied behind our back um, uh, with the lobbying uh, from yourselves. Um, and, you know, the, the profit making, I do feel like we need, do need comment on it, uh, given the management companies, the holding companies and the parent companies that are all associated uh, with, with the privatised business model uh, that, uh, that you have. So if, if we could get comment on that, that would be good. Thank you. Okay, I'll take the other speakers and then I'll bring you back in, Niall. Um, so Councillor Harkin and then Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, look, I think we're all well aware of the Bryson uh, energy scheme that was uh, announced during the Christmas break. It was £2 million uh, and there was 11 companies involved. So. The amount of money that each of the companies put in was not a lot. Uh, and maybe you're saying that you put in more than everybody else. But £2 million is a drop in the oceans, uh, given the scale of this crisis. And to be quite honest, that was part of the shameful response by the executive, uh, who have asked very, very little uh, of major energy providers, as has Westminster, because Westminster are not going after BP Shale, who are making billions. And ask and putting windfall taxes on them. So this is about uh, what we're discussing here is Firmus's individual responsibility uh, and their profiteering uh, in the face of what is a wartime uh, energy crisis and cost of living crisis and hardship crisis for ordinary people, uh, for workers and the least well off. This is not a crisis for elites. It's not a crisis for CEOs, uh, and it's not a crisis for the politically connected. So. Um, Niall, from your presentation, right, and I'm just saying uh, that, uh, and look, every CEO should be getting grilled, I guess, now from all the major uh, energy companies. Um, and I believe that the government should be facing a similar grilling because Gary put it right. People are being destroyed. People are being fleeced. And, uh, you know, and then you have P&O ferry bosses walking in and saying, yeah, we broke the law and we do it again. So what? Uh, because they know they'll get away with it. And this is all part of the same thing. But you, you made it sound like Firmus isn't making a profit, right? And um, I don't believe that, right? Uh, I don't believe that Firmus isn't making a profit. Uh, and if Firmus is has made profits over the last year, right, I think that if you're serious about caring about the community, that money, the profits that you made in our district, should be handed over to the council. Uh, we have a council-led hardship fund uh, that we're trying to get going, that we have agreed we are going to ask um, uh, major corporations and energy companies that operate in this area to make a contribution to. And that seems the right response. I don't think that energy companies should be making a profit, uh, uh, not even a 2% profit or 1% profit, given that uh, we have people now who are in destitution, and you know the the National Energy Action reported today uh, that forty percent of households now are in fuel poverty, right? And I think that's a conservative estimate. Now that is that's rocketing fuel poverty. Um, it's also the case I asked you about an ironclad guarantee that families or households wouldn't be disconnected. But you know, look, Derry against fuel poverty activists are putting it to me and saying, and they're putting it to us and saying people have already disconnected because they can't afford uh, the, their, they can't afford to heat their homes. They can't afford to use the gas. So that's already happening. Um, so so I'm really, I really want to challenge you on uh, the profits that you're making. And if you, are, if you are making profits, will you look at uh, putting those back in the district? And do you agree, do you agree that uh, energy companies should not be making a profit right now? We cannot be raising prices and then saying there's nothing we can do about this, um, but then still making a profit. And I think that's the key issue. Um, there, there should be price caps imposed by the government 
Uh, but I think individual firms as well can step up and, and uh, hear what's happening in, in communities and uh, begin to take action. Uh, I mean, look, I don't think you're telling us that this is going to continue. I only see things going in one direction, which is there's going to be more worker strikes. There's going to be more cost of living protests. There's going to be more actions like the one that you've seen yourselves at your at your uh, headquarters. Uh, and, and people, uh, you know, if there's rising destitution, there's going to be rising anger and action. Um, so I, I think that that action is geared towards getting uh, government and, and companies uh, to do things differently. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Councillor Duffy, and then I'll come back to Niall and Paul. No. Sandra. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me back in, and I will be brief um, on, on this occasion because um, I know most of it has been covered. I have a practical question, Niall, um, and it's in relation to the top up meters. To say the day before the last hike, we had a situation here in, in, in the city where people were scrambling um, to get to shops and to get their energy topped up, to get their gas topped up before midnight, before before the latest hike um, came in day being. And what we were faced with was shops who had reached their cap on what could be sold for that particular day, which was leaving some people in genuine difficulties where they didn't have any gas and couldn't top up, but also left people feeling, you know, was this some sort of move by energy companies or whatever to ensure that people were topping up using the, the new tariff? Um, there, there, there was a sense of desperation that night from people who were genuinely scrambling around different shops throughout the city, trying to find a top up unit that they could actually use to get their, their energy topped up. Is that a policy from yourselves or where does that emanate from? Because it smacked to me uh, as being completely unfair on people who are already struggling. So I, I, I don't know if that's your policy or someone else's, but I would just like to sort of understand it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to hand back to Niall and Paul to take around that second round of questions, and then we move to uh, Counter Farrer's motion. Go ahead, Niall. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm going to go somewhat in reverse order. So, so thanks. Sandra, for, for your latest question, um, look, this one came to our attention. First of all, to be to, to be direct, it, it is not, and most certainly would not be our policy um, uh, of, of any uh, making whatsoever. This uh, came to our attention because the top ups in that particular week, Sandra, were five times more than what they had been in the previous week. And for that matter, most weeks previous to that as well, it was particular. Um, and a very obvious, I suppose, uh, you described as a scramble, but certainly people wishing to top up before the implementation of the new tariff. The issue resides squarely between the pay point who administer this and the outlets um, that, that operate on their behalf. And it actually comes down to, to, to be frank, it comes down to credit risk. And since it's come to our attention, Sarah, we've been speaking to Paypoint about this in terms of, uh, quite frankly, rising and raising the credit limits on those outlets in anticipation of any future tariff announcements, right? So it was a very specific vendor to vendor. So but it was between Paypoint and the outlets themselves. It came to my attention the next day. I was not aware of it. Since becoming aware of it, we have taken action and discussed with Paypoint how we can manage the credit limits within each of the outlets. Um, as a slight aside, it has come to our attention recently when SSE announced in Belfast they experienced the same with a number and quite a number of outlets, and it was for exactly the same reason. So, to be clear, it was certainly not our policy, not of our doing, and and one which uh, we are working to to address for the future. Um, Again, going backwards, Sean, thanks again. Um, I, I would respectfully challenge the, 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 the profiteering piece. Um, I, I've used the words regrettable in terms of putting prices up. We want gas to remain the fuel of choice in dairy. And we recognise, my goodness, we fully recognise what that statement must 
uh, be in the current context and what, how it must be it might be received in the current context. But we want it to be the fuel of choice in dairy. So there is nothing that we would like to do more, quite frankly, than bring the price down again for all of our customers, but particularly those in dairy as well. And for the avoidance of doubt, the first opportunity we do get to do that, I can assure everyone in this uh, meeting today that we will work to do that. And again, I would respectfully challenge in the profiteering and I would respect, respectfully ask as well that when we publish accounts for 2021 to Companies House, um, that, that, that we will share those with you as well, Sean, and, and maybe Paul, I'll ask you to take a note that we, we do send them to Sean when they, we, when they are uh, published uh, post-auditing. Um, at a fuel poverty level, we work really closely with the likes of NEA uh, and the director of Pat Austin in Belfast. We're very cognizant of the levels of fuel poverty and, and indeed the diversity in all social sort of economic metrics um, across Northern Ireland, and particularly in Derry, to be frank, and we're, we're fully cognizant of the 40% uh, number uh, for fuel poverty in Northern Ireland, which, which I would echo your sentiments, Sean, in terms of uh, how devastating that is. For, for, for all energy customers. Um, the, the other piece, I suppose you, you mentioned about breaking the law, and, and I just want to be absolutely clear. We work with DFE. We work under license with the utility regulator in Northern Ireland. Um, we are subject to, to significant scrutiny within that context, and respectfully, significant scrutiny that perhaps unregulated businesses are not, frankly, subject to. Um, no, uh, we are we are committed to that. We have the license since two thousand and five. You're absolutely right. There's a two percent profit built into that that that, um, that license. Uh, that profit is in there. That two percent is to recognise the risk that we are undertaking as a business. Um, but it's most certainly not profiteering. And in the context to say of operating to that license, the scrutiny that we are subject to would make sure that we would never be operating outside the law, nor would it be our, 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 our desire to do so, to, just for the record. Um, and then Maeve, coming back to you, thanks for your, thanks for your comments and, and, and sort of um, read across to, to some of the slides. Look, across Northern Ireland, there's been over a billion pounds, 1.2 billion uh, invested into the networks. And whilst, again, we recognise the current challenges with natural gas, well, it won't be natural gas coming into the future. It simply won't be. It'll be biomethane. It will be ultimately hydrogen. And our network has run, it runs around dairy at the minute, is ready and able to take biomethane. It is ready and able to take that biomethane from anaerobic digesters, um, coming from whether it be animal litter, chicken litter, or, or actually municipal waste. And so there's really good examples of already of that throughout Northern Ireland. That gas, what we need is the opportunity to get that gas into our pipes. And that'll do two things, Maeve. It'll secure a greener and cleaner future, quite frankly, for Northern Ireland. But perhaps back to your point, it will provide more stability in terms of price volatility for consumers in Northern Ireland across the board. And we're working, and, and again, working hard with government to get the frameworks to make that happen in place. And actually, the current energy crisis and unprecedented prices has given any amount of impetus to push that on uh, significantly, actually. So, again, happy to, to, to pick this up with you offline at any, any, any time at all. But going green, going clean, we have the infrastructure there. It's already been paid for. We need to, to, to maximise the opportunity now. And you did mentioned the DFE's energy strategy, you will have seen in that, that they recognise the opportunity that the gas networks can, can, can provide, and indeed further connections to the gas works can make. You know, significant carbon savings moving from oil. So again, I recognise that in the context of the energy and, and cost of living crisis that we're going through at the moment. But for the longer term, there are significant benefits in utilising the gas network for the purposes of green energy, and that's what we're committed to doing. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm conscious that there's a proposal on the floor from Councillor Farrell. 
um, which was seconded by Councillor Mooney. Uh, I wonder if we could just bring that up onto the screen. Um, and then uh, I haven't heard uh, in the duration of the deputation here anyone speaking against the, the proposal. Indeed, I heard a number of councillors indicating that they were happy to support it. But I'll leave it on the screen for a few moments uh, and let the chat box sit there to see if anybody else wants to speak in relation to it. And if not, uh, we'll take that proposal as passed unanimously. Uh, Councillor Doyle, are you looking in on this item now? Please, Chair, very briefly. Um, I, I'll vote for this, um, but I have to say it, it tinkers around the edges. And I, I genuinely thought we were past the point of writing letters, uh, which aren't going to make any impact to people right now. It's, uh, you know what, it, what it comes down to is, is people are looking for action. Uh, they're not looking to see what letters we're going to get sent back to us in a couple of months' time. And it's unfortunate that it's come to the point where we're, we're now here, where tomorrow or Thursday we're going to be having a meeting about taking legal action. Uh, and in this meeting, we're talking about uh, scribbling a few words down. Um, people aren't going to thank us for that. I'll vote for it, but I'm doing so on the basis that it is tinkering around the ages. Uh, and it's, well, it's better than nothing, but it's not much better. Okay, Councillor Doyle, uh, your comments were noted. Um, uh, Councillor Farrell, did you want to come in to sum up? Yeah, uh, when I initially made the proposal, it, it's quite a while ago, uh, but I still think it's a good proposal. And I, I appreciate Councillor Doyle's support, although he, he does feel it's tinkering around the edges. But I truly believe that if we want to make gas affordable for citizens across this southern district, um, key actions need to be taken. And one of the actions is that we write to the economy department and the utility regular to reduce the, the profit cap. That won't be reduced unless we ask for it. That's the reality. And if we want, and nobody's spoken against it, if we want a, a price cap system similar to Britain, we have to ask for it. So. Councillor Doyle thinks we're tinkering around the edges. I think if we want this change, we need to ask for it. And, you know, this, these letters, they're a necessary evil. I, I don't know what way Councillor Doyle seeks to achieve this change, but we need to write. If we have a request, we need to contact the people responsible. And that's what this motion does. So, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Farrell, so the proposal is on the screen, it's been seconded, and I haven't heard anybody speaking against it, so I'm going to treat that as passed unanimously. Uh, and just to conclude the deputation, thank you both to Niall and to Paul for coming along this afternoon virtually to, to hear the frustration that's there clearly from uh, right across the, the chamber here uh, about the, the circumstances we find ourselves in and uh, the, the actions taken by the committee in relation to the motion that's just passed. Uh, we we'll certainly keep us up to date with the responses that we get back from the various government departments to whom we'll be writing. Um, if you want to log out, uh, Paul and Niall, from the meeting now, you can please do so. It has been broadcast on YouTube, so you're more than welcome to log on there and watch the end of the meeting if you so wish. Uh, but if you could log out of WebEx now, that would be appreciated so we can continue with the business. So we'll just give you a few moments to do that and then we move on to item six. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Okay, members, uh, item six is chair person's business. There's just a couple of items uh, I wanted to draw members' attention to. Um, first item is the fact that the um, uh, this month sees the learning festival, the second learning festival to take place. Uh, through our council, it's scheduled to take place uh, at the end of the month, twenty uh, fifth, the twenty ninth of April. But there's a launch event on the twelfth of April, and I think all aldermen and councillors would have received an invitation from Michelle Murphy to, uh, sorry, Michelle Murphy to that um, uh, uh, for people to register for. Uh, it, it it is a good um, uh, um, event, uh, a week long list of activities uh, as part of UNESCO Learning City. And I would encourage people to, to get involved in that uh, if they're able to. Um, 
in relation to other items of chairperson's business, I'm conscious that uh, the, the the department uh, in the Republic of Ireland, the Shared Future Unit, announced uh, a five million pound, uh, sorry, five million euro Shared Island Local Authority Development Funding Call, uh, which was uh, launched this morning. Uh, so I do hope that uh, council officers and indeed elected members can uh, can interrogate that and see what uh, opportunities there are for that fund. Uh, to be applied here in our council area uh, in conjunction with uh, partner local authorities elsewhere on the island. I think that is an opportunity for uh, for our council to uh, to attract in some funds to uh, making an improvements in uh, in relation to uh, various different um, uh, things like tourism, like uh, enterprise development, conser uh, conservation of uh, biodiversity, uh, and a range of other things. Um, so. I'm happy to, uh, to to allow members to, to look at that announcement uh, today and, and then to bring forward proposals in due course. Um, in relation to another item of your purchase business, it's just uh, a number of people um, across the waterside will have been disrupted uh, by an ongoing security alert that has been running um, since last night and continues now. Um, I've been in touch with the PSNI repeatedly today in relation to get updates on that, uh, and it is causing disruption to local residents who want to go around um, that part of the waterside uninterrupted and unfortunately uh, are not able to do that uh, at present. And I hope that the security alert comes to an end soon and that those responsible for it uh, are able to be identified. Um, I'm also conscious that um, Councillor Boyle has indicated that he wished to come in on the chairperson's business on a separate matter. So I'll bring you in now, Councillor Boyle. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and well, I, I suppose I'll keep this brief. Uh, because again, we find ourselves in a situation today where we're reflecting on a, a brutal assault on another uh, member of our community. And I want to be forthright in my condemnation uh, of what was an outrageous and barbaric attack on a man uh, in the Craigan community at Kildrum, uh, Kildrum Gardens uh, last night. Um, clearly, there's no room for or no welcome for this that sort of activity in our, our, our community and the vast majority of people I'm sure would, would share my abhorrence of, of what happened. I was actually listening to the victim's uh, mother on the radio this afternoon uh, and well, in the first instance obviously I would like to uh, send out my best wishes to the victim, uh, wish uh, him a speedy recovery and of course my best wishes again to uh, his mother uh, who was there and witnessed uh, the attack and clearly they are both going to be uh, extremely traumatised by the event. Uh, three men forced their way into their home in the dark of night. Uh, two trundled up the stairs, uh, didn't ask many questions about the sounds of it, and indeed the victim's mother believes uh, that he was entirely innocent of whatever it was that they felt uh, they were trying to uh, justify, and indeed she felt uh, that they had entirely identified, they couldn't even identify who it was. Um, so we know, we're now in a situation today where somebody's been extremely brutalised, uh, his mother has been traumatised, their family will be impacted, broadly speaking, by this, uh, and this man was attacked in his own bed, woken out of his sleep and shot twice. Uh, quite frankly, disgraceful, disgusting, and a, quite frankly, nobody could justify it. No one could possibly justify this. So again, I just want to be very forthright about that, and just to say again, on behalf of the SDLP, this kind of thing must stop. There is no way in a modern society that we have today that anybody could stand over this and say that it was the right thing to do. It was entirely the wrong thing to do to anyone. Thank you, Chet. Yes, thank you for that, um, Councillor Boyle. I see Alwyn Hussey has an item that he wishes to raise, which I'll come back to. I think uh, I'm, I'm making the assumption that Councillor Donnelly wants to come in on this item. Is that right, Gary? The same issue, Chair, yeah. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Gary. Thank you, Chair. Chair, look, the issue of punishment attacks is is very controversial, and there is a debate right throughout the community about the the, the need for them, how effective they are, or whether they're justified. And, Chair, you know, it's my opinion that, you know, sound bites and condemnation are, are you know, they're absolutely worthless in this, but what in this particular case, Chair, I've spoke to the mauler of the man who was shot, and many people in this chamber will be, you know, familiar 
with with that uh, with the Mueller uh, in our past role. And what I can find out, Chair, when I'm speaking extensively to people within this community and further, is that there's an absolute bewilderment regarding what happened in Kelvin Gardens last night. It appears, Chair, that this was a completely innocent victim. I know the victim and his family well. And this attack has caused, the manner in which it was carried out, has caused fear and anxiety. And there's no other way to say it, that it appears that a completely innocent person was subject to the, the, the horrific attack. And, you know, punishment attacks, apart from the physical injuries that they cause, they also cause a stigma, which in many cases can be as painful for the person involved as the physical injuries. And I would call on the people who carried this out. You know, there, there is structures within this community, whether well, people agree with them or not, and they're in place to ensure, you know, that, that punishment attacks don't happen. And it appears that nobody knows anything about this within them structures. And I would call on the people that, that did this, that I think, you know, it was wrong and that they need to come out and clarify it, even to remove the stigma. It won't address the physical injuries. It won't affect the, the, the trauma of the family, an innocent family at that. And I think that they do, and they need to ensure that this doesn't happen to any other innocent family. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, Councillor Duffy on the same issue. Go ahead, Sandra. Thank you, Chair. And if I break up, I apologise. My internet has um, just started playing up, but absolutely want to add my voice of condemnation in relation to this attack. Um, we have also been in contact with the family this morning um, and, and throughout the day in relation to it. It is an absolutely horrific attack and it has completely traumatised this family. Um, mother assaulted son in hospital um, in need of surgery is my understanding of it and as Councillor Donnelly has, has pointed out there is bewilderment in relation to this um, and I do think that people do need to explain what is going on because there is absolutely no place in our community in my view for these type of attacks at all. There's no justification, there's no room for guns on our streets and, and certainly not in people's houses. Um, so I would add my voice of condemnation and send my solidarity to the family that I, I do know very well um, at this time. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Councillor Harkin, is it the same item or a new item? Same item. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, look, uh, people in Craigan, people across this city, as we've just discussed in the last um, this section there, are being attacked by uh prices that they cannot afford and people are struggling and people are being left in destitution this does absolutely nothing to help people um and this attack is is only going to further traumatize uh and make people's lives difficult uh in craigan uh but also right across the city and right across the district i just think we have to send a message that we are not going to allow ourselves to be dragged back into a situation where this kind of thing becomes rife and acceptable. This, this does not serve uh, our communities. This does not uplift our communities. This does not build uh, power inside our communities. It does the opposite. And it, it's very clear right now, given the challenges that our communities face, this is only gonna pile it on and make things uh, far more difficult. Um, so I think we have to send that message very, very clearly. Our hearts go out to the, the you know, the people involved. Uh, if this was a case of make mistaken identity, identity, uh, that just makes it all the more uh, awful and worse and terrible. But even if this was not was a case wasn't a case of mistaken uh, identity, this it's still unacceptable, unjustifiable, and this should have no role in our communities right now. It's not going to serve. Uh, you know, it's not going to build uh, power. It's not going to build hope. Um, so I think we have to. Uh, you know send a loud message that uh, of, of uh, that this is unacceptable behaviour and also send a message of uh, solidarity with those who were directly impacted. 
Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Harkin. Um, I'm going to return to Alderman Hussey uh, for um, you're looking to raise an item uh, that uh, can, in relation to uh, strategic planning. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not a member of committee, uh, but um, Derek Counters this morning received an email at 11 o'clock. Uh, I'll read the email. Good morning. Counters permit under COVID with uh, DERA for operating expandment has expired. Obviously, uh, the expiry date would have been known to council officers. I have applied for a simple exemption that will allow us to continue operating in spamment until such times as we have killing up and running again, which is a long time down the line. I have had to temporarily close spamment until the exemption is approved, which I hope will be very soon. I apologize for any convenience. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Now, I realize, Chair, this is an ENR issue, but where was the forward planning in this? Officers within this council will have known uh, the expiry date of the exemption. So why has this not been dealt with? And why are the people of the DERG now, because of a lack of strategic forward planning, uh, why have they now had the uh, 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 service withdrawn of the skip service recycling uh, provision at Spamond withdrawn? It's not good enough. And surely, to goodness, somebody in council has to answer for this dereliction uh, that we in the DERG are now enduring. I note Councillor McHugh is on this. Councillor McHugh will also have received the same email. Thank you for permission uh, to raise the matter, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Osman Hossey. I, I'll bring in uh, Councillor McHugh. Go ahead, Rory. Good right, Chair. Uh, thanks. And obviously, in the same vein as Alderman Hossey, um, just begs the question really why this wasn't anticipated. Um, certainly, doesn't reflect reflect well in terms of of council. Um, obviously. The, the issue of spam out being used as a dump has been a, somewhat of a, a, a hot potato um, and the council officers will be well aware of it. So, you know, this lack of foresight, I suppose, doesn't reflect well on, on council and then obviously the councillors get the full brunt of it. So basically just concurring with what Alderman Hussey has said there. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can I thank Alderman Hussey and yourself, Dan Councillor McHugh, for raising and speaking on the issue Today, as Osborne Hussey indicated, it isn't an uh, item for this committee itself. So relevant officers are probably not on the call, but I'm sure that the chief executive is happy to take it up and for and follow it up with those that are on ENR, and then give a a, a full report to uh, this, the the councillors for the DRDA. Um, if unless you want to add anything, John, go ahead. Chair, just to reinforce that, uh, um, thank you for raising the issue. Firstly, I wasn't aware of the issue. Um, but um, I will endeavour to ensure that a follow-up email is provided uh, to members with um, with an explanation uh, and around the process. Um, sometimes there are complexities to this that are maybe not foreseen. Um, I don't know what the circumstances are in this particular case, but I'll ensure that we provide a full explanation um, to members as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, members, that uh, concludes Chairperson's business. I am conscious of time, so we're going to move on now to item seven straight away, which is the matters arising from the open minutes of the last meeting held on the Tuesday, the 1st of March, pages 15 to 32. Can I take any proposers for accuracy, please? I need a proposal for accuracy. Uh, Councillor Farrell opposed. and Councillor Mooney to second. Thank you. Uh, any matters arising people wish to raise? Not seeing any indicated speakers, so happy to move on to item eight, which is the investment strategy for Northern Ireland, pages 33 to 124 in your packs. Rachel. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. The purpose of this, this report is being prepared as a result of the uh, consultation on the investment strategy 2050 by the Strategic Investment Board on behalf of the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, the draft strategy has been duly considered and a draft corporate consultation response has been drafted and is attached with an appendix two for members' consideration. The consultation response has been framed in the context of the agreed outcomes and actions within the strategic growth plan. Um, and the need to focus on an evidence-based need um, and balanced regional development, focusing on geographical disparities and in infrastructural investment, um, and also in consideration of recent council motions. Um, members are advised that the deadline for submission of consultation responses is the 20th of April, so we have still some time to work on it, uh, subject to members' comments. So, Chair, subject to members' views, it's recommended that members approve the draft corporate consultation response attached to Appendix 2. Thank you. Thank you for that, Rachel. Um, a couple of indicated speakers, Councillor Farrell here in the Chamber and then Councillor Heaney online. Go ahead, Rory. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, nobody is unaware of, of you know, the legacy of, of neglect um, around infrastructure west of the van but specifically um, in Derry and the North West. And this investment strategy was sort of plots a course between now uh, and 2050. 2050 um, is a perfect and ideal opportunity to address that historic imbalance. And as Rachel has said, you know, regional balance is the key to this. You know, people west of the van should be afforded the same opportunities, should have access to the same services as people east of the ban and it has to be evidence-based you know the areas with the highest need um, need the most support they need more investment um, and that's what our sort of core argument should be in this investment strategy and i'm going to touch on a few things that i would like to see by 2050 i could well be dead who knows um, but, you know, whoever comes after me, hopefully they don't look back and go, why is the brand of wealth still not expanded? So I'm going to note a few things here. I'm going to start off with education and particularly further and higher education. We need to see McGee expanded. I don't know how many times I've said it in this chamber, but I'm going to say it again, just for the record. Um, we need to see expansion of Northwest Regional College because if you look at the number of students here per head of population, it's one of the lowest. It's the lowest city on the island of Ireland. We need to see an upgrade of our school estates and it's, it's welcome news that St. Bridget's College and Lumen Christie were announced the other week. Um, in terms of health, uh, we've got some of the worst health inequalities in the North. Um, some of the worst life expectancies, uh, some of the highest rates of mental health issues. So we need to see investment in health. And you know, there's a proposed city side medical hub at Fort George. You know, there's proposed expansion at Alton Galvin over the next 10 to 15 years. And there's the campaign for the detox centre, uh, which is still live, and that issue isn't going away. In terms of housing. We've got the highest rates of homelessness in the north. Therefore, we need more investment in social housing here in this city and district. Um, and I've touched on the Brandywell, but you know, in terms of culture, we need to see the Brandywell expanded. We need to see a world-class tourism project focused around the walled city. And we need to see some sort of regional gallery uh, to entice tourists um, they are a beautiful city and district. Um, in terms of connectivity, you know, A5 needs completed, A6 needs completed, including that, that middle section. Um, but there's all our roads that, that need improved uh, across this city and district. And Councillor Hulsey is probably going to say, why are you not talking about Castle Dare? But I'll leave that up to him. Boncrana Road needs widened. Um, in terms of aspiration, we need a ring road around this city. We need a third road bridge um, to improve connectivity. Um, the airport and the port uh, are going to be really, really critical 
in terms of the infrastructure. And my last point is on employment. Um, if the stars align and everything that we aspire to are delivered, it's going to have a massive impact on employment um, and economic inactivity across this, this city and district. But in terms of decentralization, I know we've got some government employees based in this city. I would like to see a government department based here. I'm not going to be prescriptive. You know, it could be based on the, the Northern Ireland executive, or in the event of a successful border poll, we could have an Irish government department uh, based in this city. Um, Edmonton and Fort George present massive, massive opportunities as well. So that's what we need to focus on. We have a massive history of economic neglect. This document, this strategy for the next 50 years, um, or for the next 30 years, is, is going to shape the, this city and district's future. And I would refer to the anti-poverty strategy. The expert advisory group said that the strategic, strategic Investment Board, which has produced this document, by the way, um, should have plans and targets to ad address geographical inequalities in employment and unemployment. And the way they do that is through targeted investment. And we're in the wrong end of all the league tables. Um, so infrastructure, targeted investment is the way to address that. So I, I fully support, I fully endorse uh, the draft response. Uh, excellent job. Thank you. So I propose that. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Farrell. Um, Councillor Heaney, go ahead, Connor. Thanks, Chair. Um, and no subject, to what I'm going to maybe suggest or make a comment on, uh, I'd be happy to second as well the, the broad thrust of, of our response. Uh, like I'm, I'm not going to go through a long list of issues, um, like Councillor Farrell, in terms of the priorities. Like the, the submission is largely based uh, on our strategic growth plan. Uh, the 2023, which we've all signed up to um, and agreed with. So uh, the thrust of it is something that's already corporate council uh, and corporate council position uh, that we're putting forward and getting on. But it is an important consultation and it is a major piece of work. And it's, it's vital that this council's voice is heard strongly and loudly in relation to, and to the investment plan. Uh, I suppose the, the, the comment would be just an like I'm not a rural councillor, but I uh, would just like to mention on behalf of those who are just the, the in item seven in the submission uh, and connectivity, there's no mention of rural broadband. Now maybe it's contained somewhere else in the submission. I just missed it. If that's the case, then I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, and the question, because this would have uh, been before my time as as a councillor, but did we make a similar? Uh, did this council make a similar submission to Ireland 2040 uh, when that was being developed? Um, or if there's to be a review of that at any point, will we be making a submission to that? Because I think it's important that this council's voice is heard in both investment plans um, on, on both sides of the border uh, as, we, as we take it forward. Because uh, as we all know, this, this region is, is totally interconnected. So that's my question. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that, Connor. Um, and then final speaker, uh, Councillor Harkin, go ahead, Sean. Thank you, Chair, for letting us in. Look, I think that uh, the um, legacy of neglect for Derry, our district, and the North West is well established. Uh, it's there in our deprivation statistics. It's there in the state of our infrastructure. It's there in the continued failure uh, to deliver uh, on the on the commitment to have 10,000 students at McGee, uh, and there's example after example, uh, and that uh, is the that is what we are trying to challenge. Um, to challenge that legacy, uh, it's it's not going to be enough to continue on with uh, the present economic uh, model that the executive parties have all backed now for 20 years, and that model is a model of promoting privatisation, running down the public sector. 
uh, lobbying for tax cuts for corporations and promoting uh, low wage jobs. Uh, we're going to need to shift the, the whole way that Stormont thinks about uh, how we're going to do economic development, how we're going to value work, um, and how we're going to actually develop a society that everybody uh, can uh, benefit from. I'll just give you the example of health because that's been pointed out. Now, we know here in our district that people suffer from uh, worse in health inequalities and elsewhere. Uh, there's now a, a, an 800 pound uh, private health care market. That just didn't happen. That was consciously created by the executive. Uh, so there's tremendous profiteering happening now around health, uh, private health care homes, uh, massive agencies right now that are playing a role in running down the health service, uh, private insurance firms. Um, I mean, these are just some of the examples. That That is all undermining uh, our ability here to create a society that is cohesive, uh, where people have good health uh, and where there's more more equality. And that that is going in the wrong direction because that is being promoted directly against the, against the, uh, the health service. Another example, which we talked about in here now, uh, but, but needs to be mentioned, is this issue of free ports. Um, because we've had a discussion and we were promised that whatever was going to be developed around uh, our port would not be a Tory, um, uh, the Tory model. Now, the issue of free ports has come into the, into the, uh, into the uh, public view because DP World uh, the, the, uh, is owned by the UAE. And they, they own ports all over the world. They own free ports all over the world. And they are promoting tax avoidance. They're uh, deregulating. They're undermining workers' rights. Um, and we're not going to be able to build up um, our dairy and our district in the Northwest if we have that in the middle of it. So this is what I mean about challenging this economic model that has been promoting privatization, which is profits for a tiny few, worse services for everybody else. Um, that is going to have to be uh, we're going to have to challenge that, and I think that that needs to be in our submission uh, for this uh, investment strategy uh, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I know I'm conscious there was a question from Councillor um, Haney in relation to his contribution. If uh, Rachel, if you're able to pick that up, just. Yeah, we can add to that. It's in 0.7.5, but you maybe strengthen it in relation to rural broadband as well, too. So thanks for that. Yep. Chair, I think there was a, a supplementary question on around Ireland 2040. Um, and uh, just to advise members that at the time that Ireland 2040 was being reviewed, there were very um, substantive submissions made um, through the uh, Northwest Regional Development Group uh, to the uh, um, to the respective department and the Irish government, positioning the Northwest City region in particular and the needs and priorities of the Northwest City region um, into the document. And I think anybody who uh, looks at that document would, would, would see the prominence that has now been given uh, to uh, the, 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 the Derry, Straban, Letterkenny urban area uh, and the surrounding uh, um, areas within the rest of the council area and Donegal County Council area. So there was very strong submission um, made in and around the Northwest priorities. Um, and much of that was captured in the Ireland 2040 document. I think there's an opportunity members to build on that now when there are reviews of that um, policy document um, taking place that we can then drill in more specifically and to the priorities of the region now that the region has been recognised strategically in the in the planning document itself. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, John and Rachel. Um, <coughs> I, I see Alderman Guy is looking in. Go ahead, Darren. Chair, it's uh, Ryan McCready on Darren's iPad. Do you okay. mind if I just crack Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, Chair. No, it's specifically in relation to the, the free ports. Um, I, I don't want a false start here. We need a free port or a free enterprise model in the Northwest region. If that doesn't happen, we'll be talking the same thing in 20 years time about being dairy being stuck in the past. We need to capitalize on the city deals, the future inclusive fund and build on that through a free port model. The free port model can be bespoke. It's not a, a straight extraction from previous uh, iterations of it. You know, 
back in Shannon when it wasn't as big as it is now, from three thousand jobs to seven thousand jobs in a space of you know five to seven years, that that is astronomical. If what we would apply here, and in, in this city and region, uh, it's nothing to be afraid of. I don't see it linked with uh, money from the Middle East or anything else. This comes direct from the UK Treasury. It's been laid out. Scotland has adopted it, and they have uh, rebranded and uh, tinkered to suit Scotland, called the Free Port, or sorry, the Green Port. Similarly, in England, they have a free port. We in Northern Ireland are due and are owed and deserve a free port model. It is up to the executive and the Department of Finance to uh, and put this joint bid together from Belfast uh, conglomerate and indeed the joint bid here in the Northwest. But our council need to be behind that. We can't be, be, be uncertain on strategic matters such as this. It drives away investment. It, it, it just penalizes our workforce. We want them to increase in wages, the uh, increase in job opportunities and employment throughout the entire region. So for, from my point of view, my position with the Austrian Unionist Party is we support the concept, the implementation of a free port model, whether that's free enterprise, green port, call it what you will. We need it, we deserve it, and let's get on with it. Thanks, Chair. Okay, folks, um, we've had a good discussion on that. I know it's been proposed by Councillor Farrell and then seconded by Councillor Heaney, so um, happy to take that as, as approved um, and to move on to the next item, which is item nine, which is the Director de Delivery Plan. Ellen? Um, yes, through you, Chair. Uh, this report presents for members' consideration and approval the delivery plan for the strategic planning and support services for the year 22-23. Um, as highlighted in the report, uh, director of delivery plans are part of the Council's planning and improvement pre framework, which also include the community plan, local community plans, corporate plan and performance improvement plans. Um, each of these is based on, on a a standardized template which has been updated this year to also include COVID recovery objectives and each of the directors will be bringing forward their reports to their respective uh, committees. Um, the directorate delivery plan helps communicate and cascade obviously our objectives but also is an important element in terms of working towards uh, continuous improvement. Um, the recommendation in front of members today is that uh, subject to your comments uh, that the particular delivery plan at Appendix 1 is approved. Thank you members. Thanks for that Ellen. Um, uh, Councillor McHugh, go ahead. All right. Well, good chair, and thanks to Alan for the report there. And indeed, uh, thanks to the directorate and indeed the uh, the waiter staff and uh, composing uh, this report. Um, on behalf of my own party, we'd be content with the recommendation, content to propose it, obviously. And just reading through the report uh, yesterday, the only thing that really um, I had a query on, um, and I noticed compared to 1819 1920 the figure of formal complaints is uh as well down but um and compared to last year there's um, nearly a 70 percent increase in formal complaints so um by and or by and large I welcome and uh commend the report uh, you know most of the targets have been met but just on that particular issue just is there any particular reason why uh, there's such a jump in the in the previous years to formal complaints or thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Mooney, I think it's looking in as well. Um, before we bring you back in, go ahead, Sean. Um, through you, Chair, we're, we're currently reviewing that, um, and obviously, as is one of our key imp improvement objectives, we're care very keen to improve on our performance in that. And I would probably highlight that obviously, COVID itself has presented a number of challenges for ourselves in terms of services. But certainly, as I say, we will look at that and, and if necessary, bring forward a further report. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dion. And, um... Yes, the LP is happy to can happy to second and second this proposal. Um, we're content. We've read through the document and um, it's largely um, good work as usual from this particular directorate. And uh, we're happy to say it is second. It. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Um, no other indicated speakers. We're going to take that item as approved. Thank you, Ellen. 
Um, moving on to item 10, then the Derry Road Chamber. Yes, through you, Chair. Uh, this report uh, seeks members' endorsement for proposed changes to the facilities in the Derry Road Chamber so as to facilitate uh, the safe operation of council committee meetings whilst COVID continues to be a health risk. So, in terms of the background there, as highlighted, um, from its inception, this council has taken, um, has held committee meetings in a rotating basis um, in the Guildhall Chamber and also the Derry Road Chamber, obviously, to promote access accessibility and inclusivity across our council area. Um, since the beginning of COVID, it's not been possible to hold a uh, normal program of committee meetings at the Derry Road Chamber due to uh, social distancing requirements and the lack of digital infrastructure uh, for the broadcasting of meetings. Um, at the January meeting uh, uh, of council, it was agreed to develop or, or begin to um, move back into the rotating committee meetings between the two chambers. So the key issues which is uh, contained in this report is that to facilitate that safe operation um, of the Dairy Road Chamber in the context of COVID, there are physical modifications required within the chamber. Um, scoping exercise has been carried out and identified the need for additional um, seating and, and new audio and, and uh, visual technologies. And, and as you can see, we, we look at various scenarios there. Um, and in terms of, of, of going forward, um, we really are keen to see a solution that provides a comparable uh, service to that being offered via the chamber here in the guild hall um, the recommendations sorry so we, we have actually identified a way forward and indicative costings for that uh, requires the procurement of a new digital system um, and the costs are anticipated to be within the region of 20,000 which we understand that we can um, source through a COVID funding stream. So the recommendation, again, subject to members uh, uh, comments today that you prove the recommendations or modifications and associated costs to facilitate the operation of committee meetings in the Derry Road Chamber. Thank you, members. Thank you very much for that, Ellen. Um, happy enough to open it up to the floor. Any comments or proposals in relation to it? People are content enough with the item as presented. No, I need a proposal for it, please. Uh, Councillor Boyle, happy to propose it. Seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Farrell, okay, thank you for that. Um, <coughs> item 11 then is the meeting schedule. Through you, Chair. Um, this report seeks elected members' approval for the proposed schedule of meetings for the 22 23 years set out in Appendix 1. And it also seeks members' views on a, on a potential rescheduling of meetings uh, for this May. So the Paragraphs 2.1 to 2.3 highlight our established framework within which we schedule um, or with, within which we prepare the schedule of meetings. Um, I would highlight as well at 2.4 that the current meeting schedule for 21-22 currently contains provision for meetings for governance and strategic planning, planning and uh, the planning reconvened committee meeting to take place on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of May respectively. And it's noted that, uh, as I say, this uh, uh, in the very same week, i.e. the 5th of May, the Northern Ireland Assembly elections take place. The key issues uh, presented in terms of the report is that the schedule for 22-23 um, reflects the principles and practices that we've uh, developed as a council and that the during COVID uh, again highlights that the rotation of um, customer facing committees between the Dairy and Dairy Road Chambers was suspended, but that this new schedule uh, um, aims to, again, subject to the completion of physical requirements, um, hopes to see the resumption of um, meetings in the Dairy Road Chamber in July. Um, so that, again, as I say, highlights the subject to the completion of those necessary works. Uh, again, based on the um, premise that social distance arrangements will be in place for some time or, or for a period of time. All committee members are intent or encouraged to attend meetings physically, whilst non-committee members may only attend remotely. Um, 
the report highlights again that it's noted that going forward meetings of the council will continue to be held remotely till July and then that that would be again reviewed uh, at that stage and all of this is in the context of COVID guidance and as reflected in the schedule it's proposed that committee meetings will continue in a hybrid format until December and arrangements uh, for January 23 onwards will be confirmed at a later date. Um, the Again, it, this new schedule also reflects the election uh, in 2023. Um, and so at that stage as well, as, um, so again, in terms of the recommendations in front of members today is firstly, that subject to members' comments, the meeting schedule for 22-23. Uh, set out in Appendix 1 is adopted and again subject to members views today the meetings scheduled for the 3rd, 4th and 5th of May 22, uh, that's next month, are rescheduled to the 17th, 18th and 19th of May respectively. Thank you members. Okay, thanks for that Ellen. Um, uh, Alderman McClintock. Hillary, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ellen, for the report. Absolutely no problem um, with the, the schedule as presented before us. I think it's uh, obviously sensible, and the only thing to do is to change those meetings in May. I think we're all finding the pressure already of trying to cope with all the council meetings and all the other uh, demands on us at this present time. Just wanted to make uh, one point, Chair, if I may, and I note that Ellen did say about um, the, this would be kept under a few. I think it was from December to, uh, like from December next. But I think that hybrid meetings have served us very, very well. We've all learned a new way of working since the pandemic. And it's just something that as a party, we uh, would ask that hybrid meetings might be the way forward in the future. We all of us want to encourage new people into the council chamber. And aware at the moment that some of our members, if they are traveling from Castledare, Kiln or wherever it may be, have a round trip of 60 miles if they're coming to the Guildhall. Mindful also of all those with uh, caring responsibilities and people with other work commitments as well. So it would be our view at this early stage, even that hybrid meetings are should be with us for uh, the way forward, because um, that is the new way I think that people are expecting to work. But obviously, this is going to be under a few and it will come up again at a later stage. Just wanted to make that comment. Happy to propose the, um, the paper before us now, though, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Hilary. Um, Councillor Mooney, go ahead, Sean. Uh, thank you, Chair. Happy to second that at, at, uh, that item. Um, Chair, just for some some clarification, um, I remember when, when COVID did strike and uh, we initially done the hybrid meetings and then the WebEx as such, and, we, and we're still in that as well. My understanding was it was a DFC regulation that we had the interim that. Is DFC coming back to us in relation to reverting back to the old system because obviously you know it's not up to us really it's a legal regulation from dfc it was my understanding when we went in there initially around march 2020 i was only new to the chamber but um obviously you know you know the process of democracy has to be in a chamber and transparent i understand other mammoth context views on it but um it's simply my understanding is it really wasn't our uh, it really wasn't down to us it was um it was um, a regulation from the EFC. Uh, just some clarity, please, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, for that, Sean. John, did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to clarify that the um, the legislation that permitted us to uh, perform business in a hybrid nature um, did expire uh, just um, just last month, just a number of weeks ago, and um, the Assembly brought into place uh, legislation that enabled that to continue. Um, for the for, for for the time being, um, there will come a point where DSC will then guide further, or the assembly will guide further on how councils can operate. Um, so for um, for now, um, we're suggesting that committees would continue in a hybrid fashion up until roughly um, December, and then we would take a view on it. And obviously, that view will be dependent both on. Um, members' wishes, but also in the legislative environment at that stage. Okay, thanks for that clarification, John. Um, so that item is proposed by uh, Hillary, seconded by Sean. Uh, so happy to take that as approved. Um, next item then is item 12. Ellen again. Yeah, um, this 
report seeks approval for a formalized uh, procedure for se uh, selecting and costing uh, conferences for members attendance and also seeks to designate attendance at conferences organized by external bodies on which members have been appointed onto by council as an approved duty. Um, the background is set out in terms of the report in that we have a process, but there have been a number of queries. So, as I say, we have sought to actually uh, formalize the procedure um, in developing uh, that uh, particular procedure that's a um, set out at Appendix 1, the elected member development group have been consulted and have endorsed the attached procedure. Um, so, as, as I say, in terms of the recommendation in front of members today, um, that uh, it's to firstly approve the procedure for selecting and costing uh, conferences for member attendance and to designate, as I say, the attendance at conferences organised by external bodies uh, on which members have been appointed onto council by as an approved duty. And obviously that one is, is highlighted in the report is really only in circumstances where we get late notice as such. Thank you, members. Yes, thanks for that, Ellen. I'm happy to, to open that up to the floor for comment or, or proposals. Anybody wants to make a proposal in relation to it? Okay, thanks, Councillor Boyd, proposed and seconded, and Councillor Mooney. Okay, members, thank you. Um, item 13 then is building stronger communities. Yes, and, and, and members and through you, Chair, this one seeks approval for costs associated uh, with a member attendance at a final session of the, the uh, Building Stronger Community programmes. Um, the details in terms of the background are set out in the report and, and would advise this it relates to uh, one elected member who um, there are costs associated with the participation in the final stage of the, the programme um, in terms of the um, De virtual delegation to, to uh, Bosnia. Um, so as the key issues really is Councillor Kelly is committed, committed to the six week programme and relayed positive feedback and its content relevancy and transferability. The final session, uh, which is an important aspect, um, is to be held um, in terms of um, uh, participation in that final event. And um, in doing so, members, uh, Councillor Kelly will share any sort of uh, attendance uh, packages or, or information provided at that. The recommendation in front of members uh, today is to approve the costs associated with Councillor Kelly, Kelly's attendance at the final session of that Building Stronger Communities programme. Thank you, members. Okay, Helen, thank you for that. Happy to again seek a proposal or second or a comment on this. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Just proposed and uh, Councillor Mooney seconded it again. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, folks, that concludes the items that are in uh, open for decision. So items 14 to 17 are open for information. So happy to take those as uh, as, as read, uh, unless people want to speak to them. Um, Councillor Farrell, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, very briefly, item 15 is about the Strategic Growth Partnership, and it's not specifically about the Strategic Growth Partnership. Um, at the last governance meeting, we had a, a discussion um, about uh, the, the strategic growth plan. And in response to a question I had about McGee, the chief executive said that there was a workshop organized by UU, which members of the strategic growth partnership were invited to, and it was going to be about student numbers, but unfortunately it was canceled due to the industrial action a fortnight ago. Um, has it been rescheduled or do we have any sort of date in the diary? Because obviously it's a burning issue and we'd be keen to get that engagement with you. you. Thank you. Chair, um, just through you, we're, we're working with the Vice Chancellor's Office to get a rescheduled date. And as soon as that's possible, we'll obviously get that out to all members and all members of the SGP as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Farrak. Uh, can I have a proposer and a seconder then to go into confidential, please? Uh, Councillor Farrell. I'd second it. Okay, thank you, Alderman Breslin. Uh, so just bear with us a moment to go into confidential members. Thank you. 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 Th